Welcome to Farsight's Intelligent uh, Cooperation Group. Uh, today we'll have Vernon Smith, uh, who has a Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences, and he'll be discussing the classical theory um, of price discovery in markets. And we'll have uh, Andy McAfee from the M MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy, uh, discussing civilizational progress, accelerating its drivers. And so this, both of those uh, invitations from us um, were inspired by uh, the chapter three that we shared with you, um, I think already, um, and that we would love your feedbacks on. Uh, and both of the speakers from today, they are featured also in, uh, they are featured also in our chapter. I just shared the chapter with you again. And uh, in that chapter, to give you a very brief overview, um, we suggest that intelligent volunteer cooperation makes our civilization both super intelligent and more and more aligned with our interests. And we show how under the starting conditions of declining violence, we developed uh, today's deeply compositional um, cooperative uh, ecosystem using property rights and networks of contracts. And over time, civilization is really becoming more intelligent by developing better and better abstraction boundaries from APIs to institutions that coordinate the local knowledge of both human and also increasingly computational entities into a really astounding problem-solving ability. And uh, today we'll hear both about uh, the mechanisms that make our civilization super intelligent, and that will be Vernon. Uh, and then also hearing about how civilization is more and more aligned with our interests from uh, Andrew McAfee. And I think the two actually fit really well together, right? And, and I think both of those factors really increase the problem-solving ability from uh, civilization. So I'm really, really happy to have Andrew here. His book, More From Less, uh, has been a really, really fun and, and super enlightening read. Um, definitely, I think, a very optimistic, um, but without being Pollyannish, take on the future. Um, and um, I think it's really counterintuitive for some of us that progress has occurred in our civilization sometimes. But we show in the chapter how, from a decline of violence and increase in health, education, and freedom, we're really making very, very fast progress. But from our from within our well working civilization, it's sometimes really hard to appreciate where we've come. Uh, we tend to find uncommon phenomena really interesting and common phenomena really boring. And so we focus on unusual predatory behavior and crime um, over boring symbiosis and trades and markets. And so this tendency, one could call it uh, an outlier inversion, is really amplified uh, by the media, which reports on interesting cases of crime and embezzlement more than on the positive, boring positive trends. And so I'm really, really happy to have Andrew here to shake uh, us up uh, a little bit in that. And he um, tackles perhaps one of the most counterintuitive uh, examples, which is that we're also making modest progress on big problems such as air pollution, uh, which is still one of the number one causes of environment related deaths. So I'm super happy to have you here uh, to shake us up a little bit. Uh, I will post more about you and about your background in the chat. But without further ado, please take it away. I'm thrilled to have you here. Yeah, very, very excited for the discussion. Great. Allison, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this fantastic group. Um, my job is to stall until Vernon Smith shows up. We got an email shortly before our scheduled start time that he is waiting for his wife's second COVID shot, which is the best excuse in recorded history. So we can't fault him for that. I'm going to talk very, very slowly until Vernon shows up, at which time I'm going to vanish immediately from the scene. So please bear with us. Uh, what I'm actually going to do until Vernon shows up is try to give a really quick overview of the book More From Less that I published in October of 2019 that came about because of this weird body of evidence that I was exposed to that I didn't believe at first, which essentially said that we, are, we have learned how to lighten up on the planet that we all live on. And when I first came across that, I thought that uh, the essayist, the scholar who wrote it, a guy named Jesse Ozabel at Rockefeller, who some of us might know, I thought that Jesse was just confused about something because that's not how growth works. My understanding was that economies grow, populations grow, prosperities grow, wants and needs grow, they grow without end, and as a result, our burden on our planet increases. And maybe I thought that that burden was tolerable because we live on a big planet. If we don't do stupid things, we could handle that until, you know, population levels off and we vanish slowly from the face of the earth. But I didn't see a mechanism by which we would, as a, as a whole, and without making conscious choices to renounce consumption and renounce prosperity, ever learn to lighten up in a meaningful way on our planet. So when Jesse wrote that essay and I read it, I thought, he's missing something kind of obvious. I went and looked at his evidence because he's 
careful scholar, he presented all of his sources. And I came to the conclusion that he was dead flat right. And if anything, uh, he was actually underestimating the phenomenon. He was being too circumspect about what's going on. So I want to try to lay out the evidence that supports what this, this more optimistic view about our relationship with our planet. And I want to do that in the context of talking about some of the big problems that we have faced in our fairly recent history and what our progress is in dealing with them. Because I think I, I find that history really illuminating and uh, encouraging overall. So are you all looking at a title slide right now? Please nod your heads. Yep. All right, yep. we are handling the technology. Uh, the first big problem came up little more than two centuries ago. And it appeared to be a large problem, which is that essentially everyone's going to starve and there's nothing we can do about it. This would qualify as a big problem in I think anyone's book. And it came primarily from this sunny optimist. Some of us probably recognize Reverend Thomas Malthus who wrote his essay on principles of population right at the end of the 18th century. And he said, look, uh, you know, do the math. We human beings tend to have an exponentially increasing population, two, four, eight, 16. Our ability to grow food and otherwise take resource from the, resources from the earth to feed ourselves, that only goes up linearly, two, three, four, five. Malthus said those curves are going to cross. And when they do, uh, that the cruel correcting mechanism of famine is going to bring that population back down. So graphically, what his theory was essentially that we might like to be here. We human beings might want to have a lot of us, and we want to have a high standard of living, but the constraints of our ability to take resources and food from the environment are dooming us to swing back and forth on this really unhappy pendulum. And Malthus talked about oscillations and vibrations between periods when there weren't very much of us, so we could all be a little bit more prosperous, and periods where we overshot what we could take from the earth, and there are more of us, but we were living in some kind of abject misery. And a lot of people, myself included, now use Malthusianism, Malthusian as an insult, because uh, it's, it's a shorthand for a deeply wrong forecaster. To me, what's interesting and what I didn't realize when I started researching the book, Malthus was actually a decent amateur historian because it turns out if you actually draw this graph for hundreds of years before Malthus wrote, uh, you find out he was actually pretty close to correct. So Gregory Clark is an economic historian who does some really wonderful work. And I, I took this graph from him. He was able to reconstruct exactly that trade-off between prosperity and population for hundreds of years in England. I think there are particularly good records going back. And so what Clark was able to do was graph decade by decade, the quality of life for call it the average in, uh, English laborer. And we can see how that's going. And this is what you learn when you draw that graph. Here's what the 1200s look like. Here's what the 1300s look like. Here are the 1400s. Here are the 15, 16. Things got a little bit better apparently in the 1700s because the agricultural revolution was kicking off. But this graph to me is, is fascinating. Even with those kind of improvements that we see in the 1700s, the average Englishman had a worse standard of living, a worse real standard of living throughout the 1700s than they did in 1200. We were living in this Malthusian world, this oscillating world back and forth, and hundreds of years of evidence, which Malthus didn't have access to, but we do now, shows us that we were not really able to break out of that trap. I'm going to flash another well-known Englishman on the screen. A lot of us probably recognize who this is. Uh, this is James Watt the tinkerer who improved the steam engine to the point where it became economically viable for, first of all, extracting, um, uh, bailing out soggy English coal mines and then all kinds of other things, and was one of the prime developments that kicked off the Industrial Revolution. And I think that the Industrial Revolution is the biggest story in human history up until now. And a short, description or explanation of why I believe that can come if we just extend that Malthusian graph. If we just draw two more centuries of evidence, we can see how big a deal 
the industrial revolution, the steam engine and all of its cousins were. So we're gonna keep drawing that graph. But to do that, I've had to expand the axes because all the evidence, all the data that we've looked at so far fits down into that tiny little corner of the graph. There, that's all the data we've seen so far. Here are what the 1800s look like. Here are what the 1900s look like. So finally, we find ourselves up in the happy, the magic quadrant of the graph where we are achieving both higher population and higher prosperity over time. This thing that Malthus says we couldn't really do. Uh, another way to say that you've got fast growing populations and quickly increasing prosperity is to say that your real GDP is increasing, which is exactly what we see if we look at the economic data in a different way. This story is not just an English story. Here's an estimate of what the world GDP looked like from 1270 to 2015. So this is, this is a 90 degree shift in human history. This really changed the, changed the shape of history quite literally. And we can go back and look at the thing that Malthus was originally worried about, which is the, the prevalence of famine throughout the world. And uh, thanks to Our World and Data, which I think in addition to Wikipedia is my favorite nerd website to visit because almost any data set that you're interested in or any question about humankind that where you can uh, where evidence might provide answers, they probably have that evidence at our world and data. So if, if you're not a fan, if you're not a supporter, please, this is like my pledge drive part of the presentation. I'm not affiliated with our world and data. I'm just a fanatic user of it. Uh, so please check it out and, and become part of that community. Here's one thing I learned from our world and data. You can look at global deaths by famine around the world. And this is what that data looked like from about the mid 19th century on. This is what was happening to world population during that same time. So even as there were more and more of us, there were fewer and fewer of us dying from starvation. And if you are able to subtract out the famines that happened because of the unbelievably bad idea of collectivized economies, this is really what the situation looked like. So our ability in market-oriented societies to feed everybody has gone up dramatically at the same time that the pressure, the number of mouths that need to be fed has been going up dramatically as well. So the first big problem that we were worried about is we can have people or we can have prosperity, but we can't have both. Uh, I don't think we should believe that anymore. I think the evidence is overwhelming here. The industrial revolution got us out of that particular problem. Um, after the industrial revolution had been ticking along for about 170 years, a second problem reared its ugly head. And we started to hear about this a lot just about 50 years ago at the time of the first Earth Day, which happened in April of 1970 in America and around the world. And the problem people got worried about on Earth Day, one of the big problems was essentially the inverse of Malthus's problem. Malthus said, we can't scratch enough from the earth to provide a decent standard of living for ourselves. The problem that the Earth Day crowd brought up was we can take everything from the earth. We can absolutely exist, exhaust its bounty. We have that technological capability now and we're going to use it. And wow, is that gonna cause the biggest Malthusian crash of all time. Uh, I wanna switch from the US to the UK. Here, here's the size of the crowd for the first Earth Day in April of 1970. I wanna switch from the UK to the US because I've got access to some better data for the kinds of things that I, I wanna show you here. Here is the American economy, the real American economy for 170 years starting in 1800. And again, steady exponential growth outside of wars and depressions and things like that. Th that that's fine. Here's the Earth Day problem overlaid on that. This is energy consumption year by year for the American economy. There is just about a perfect one for one relationship there. Uh, we, can, we can have more economic output. It's going to take more joules, more BTUs every year to generate that output. Out, output. And you started to hear the slogan, we cannot have infinite growth on a finite planet. Graphs like this are where that slogan originated. If you keep drawing that exponential green line, you get pessimistic because we can't keep doing that exponential gray line. We're gonna exhaust the bounty of fossil fuels out there. 
I, I can home in on the 20th century because by act of Congress, the US Geological Survey has been keeping consistent year by year tallies of our aggregate resource consumption for lots of different resources. So for the questions that I was interested in, this USGS data is an absolute gold mine. Again, here's 70 years of real economic growth in the United States. Here is metal use year by year in the United States. Here is fertilizer use year by year. And with variations, you see the same pattern. You see exponential increases in our use of resources to generate, to build our economy, literally and figuratively. And again, you keep drawing those graphs far, far enough into the future and you get fairly pessimistic about things. A lot of the books that were published around the time of Earth Day that examine this relationship were fairly pessimistic books. Um, I am not sure that the title Famine 1975 needs an exclamation point, but the authors decided to put one there to underscore how dire the situation was. The Limits to Growth came out of MIT, came out of my institution, where the System Dynamics Group built an interactive computer simulation of the world economy. They could not find a way to have that simulated global economy not crash by about the middle of the 21st century. So they wrote a very gloomy book, Limits to Growth. And they essentially said, look gang, we don't really like collectivized or centrally planned economies. We can't really see an alternative here. So the overall tone around the time of Earth Day was quite pessimistic. And you, you can grab some of your favorite pull quotes about our resource use and about our inability to continue that exponential growth. And it was really nicely summarized in this book, um, Andre Gorsh, uh, Ecology as Politics. He said, leveling off our growth is not going to be enough. We have to start consciously declining our prosperity and or our population. We have to make those green lines start to go down because we can't keep doing what we're doing with those gray lines. Uh, this is where the degrowth movement originated. This is where we got the slogan, finite growth on an infinite planet is impossible. And the degrowth movement is still with us. And you see graffiti like this saying, look, the only sustainable path forward is for us to make conscious choices and embrace degrowth. I wanna make one thing incredibly clear, just as clear as I can, we did not do this. The, gro the global anti-growth movement is not really a thing, has not been a thing for more than half a century. Uh, here's the graph that I was drawing before up until 1970 of real GDP growth in America. That's what's been happening since. It is hard to see evidence of degrowth at any scale here. Uh, we've had more than 265%, 250% uh, growth in the American economy. The world economy has grown by more than three and a half times since 1970. So if anyone starts patting themselves on the back about the success of the degrowth movement, uh, I don't know what evidence they're looking at. That movement is still with us and says, now more than ever, we have to do it. I want to show some evidence that we don't have to do it because we figured something else out instead. And I, I, want, to do, I want to show evidence about this still to me a kind of bizarre in a good way turning point that we've achieved where we are still increasing our output, our prosperity, but we've learned to do it while taking less from the earth. Uh, for me, this uh, a, a good place to start is agriculture in the United States. And here's, a, I am really sorry for this pun in advance, here's an apples to apples comparison of the tonnage of output of American agriculture. America is an agricultural juggernaut. Every non-recession year, the, the weight of our output goes up. Here's the tonnage or the acreage of a bunch of inputs. Here's total fertilizer use, not per acre, not per person, total fertilizer use in the country. Here's the total amount of water that we need to generate that crop tonnage. Here is the total amount of farmland that we need to grow all of that agriculture. So you see kind of a, a leveling off and in some cases a long slow decline in recent decades while the output continues to grow up, to go up. We've just, we've decoupled the output from the inputs in the area of agriculture. If we look more broadly at the economy, we see this same phenomenon, this more from less phenomenon showing up in lots of different places. Again, here's real GDP, 
Here's total paper use in America. Here's total timber use in America. I apologize because I sound like a broken record here. This is not per person. Uh, this is not per dollar of output. This is just the raw amount of paper and wood that our economy consumes taking imports and exports into account. No matter how many times I say that last phrase, people say this is because of globalization. This is not because of globalization. This is because of other things, which we're gonna get a chance to talk about. I wanna talk about what's been happening to metals use in America. And the situation is one wrinkle more complicated there because we don't have good ways to tally up the metals that are embedded in the cars and the computers that we import and export around the world. That tonnage is really hidden from the statistics and I haven't found a good way to estimate it. So there's a little bit of a caveat here. That said, I wanna show you metals use and to make the case that it's not because of globalization, I wanna show you first of all, what's been happening to the size of our manufacturing industries, to our manufacturing output in America. Uh, American, manufacture, American manufacturing employment is going down. American manufacturing output is not going down. And in particular, the composition of our manufacturing industries has changed remarkably little over this period of time. We still make big, heavy, big ticket stuff in this country. Okay, with, with that extensive caveating out of the way, this is what total metals use has been looking like in America. And this is wig more wiggly, but in all cases, we see the same kind of flattening out, and then in most cases, an overall decline. The other, other thing that I really want to point out about this graph is that I tried to make the color of the line for each metal correspond to the color of the metal. And I just want credit for that level of kind of graphical attention. To I'm getting some thumbs up, which I appreciate very, very much. Thank you. But again, we see this kind of decoupling taking place. And the more, I can't show you all the different places that I looked because the phenomenon is just the same and it gets boring after a while. But I do wanna show one more. Let's go back and look at energy use. Remember, this is where we were up until 1970. Here's 170 years of economic output combined with energy use in America. This is what's been happening since 1970. We have an almost total decoupling. Uh, I have placed a public bet on the Long Bets website that America will use less overall energy in 2029 than it did in 2019. I am feeling pretty good about that bet. Uh, because of this plateauing of energy and because of the fracking revolution and the shift away from coal, as a primary energy source, this is what our total CO2 emissions have been uh, trending as a country. This, take, this particular line does take imports and exports into account. It's the best picture we have of America's consumption-based CO2. We're on a downward trend. Now, I wanna be clear, this trend is not downward quickly enough. Global warming is real and it's bad and it's us and we need to be doing better and we'll I'm sure we'll talk about it, but the idea that 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 we that we are doomed to only do more of everything that idea just is not supported by the evidence at all. And in the book, I spend a decent amount of time talking about why. How did we achieve this decoupling if it wasn't by voluntary degrowth or uh, you know a, a national level or global level? materials allocation bureaucracy, which some people are honestly advocating for these days. What did happen? And to answer that question, my favorite exhibit A for what actually happened here, and I mean this seriously, is a Radio Shack ad from 1991. Uh, there's a newsman in Buffalo whose idea of a good time, retired newsman, was to go around and look through yard sales and he found a stack of Buffalo News newspapers from the early 90s, bought them for five bucks, took them home, went through them, and he found this Radio Shack ad, I think from President's Day of 1991. And he noticed that there are 15 different physical devices on this ad. He said 13 of these things no longer exist as separate physical devices for most of us. They have all vanished into a smartphone. And 
I think that's just about right. My, my house has zero CD players in it, zero answering machines. There's no fax machine. I've got an HP 12C on my iPhone. All these devices have just kind of collapsed down into this very small, very materials lightweight piece of equipment. It's not that we don't want to compute or calculate or listen to music or take photos. And we haven't renounced our desire to consume. We're doing more of all of that, but we're doing it with a demonstrably, I think, smaller materials footprint. I want to give you one more example, uh, which I got from Bloomberg. It used to be the case that if you were designing an internal combustion engine, you faced trade-offs. You could make it physically lighter, you could make it more powerful, or you could make it more fuel efficient, but you kind of had to pick one of those for absolute improvement, or maybe two of them at best. And that's just not the case anymore. This is what's been happening to the power measured by zero to 60 time of Americans' vehicles, uh, internal combustion engines. This is what's been happening to their actual size, their physical displacement, and this is what's been happening to their fuel efficiency at the same time. So those trade-offs are just not nearly as binding as they used to be. We can't get better on all three as quickly as we'd like, but we can pretty clearly get better at all three now. When I go to Autodesk, which is one of my favorite companies to visit, and I show them things like this, they're just not surprised by that. They make the software that makers use to make things like internal combustion engines. They say, look, our simulation capabilities are so fantastic now that you can iterate hundreds or millions of internal combustion engines. You can find every trick out there and you can make these things simultaneously, physically smaller and lighter, more powerful and more fuel efficient over time. And the story that I tell in the book is of kind of life by a thousand cuts, just, uh, profit-seeking companies employing lots of very smart people to trim, to swap out materials, to make things a little better optimized, to find a cheaper way to do something. And the sum total of all those individually small materials use cuts are, are the graphs that I was showing just a minute ago. So the problem that we have been worried about since Earth Day, one of the main problems, is that we're just gonna exhaust the bounty of the Earth. I'm not worried about that anymore because of this combination, this, this inherent problem solving combination of incredibly powerful technologies and market based economies, profit seeking companies. A lot of the um, progressive folk that I talk with, I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, I talk to a lot of them. A lot of them think that capitalism is just this inherent evil, this thing that gobbles up the world. One thing I try to point out is that the desire for profits is always a desire to cut costs. And that's usually the cheap way to increase your profits. A penny saved is a penny earned. So this relentless quest for profits brings with it a relentless quest for materials efficiency, because materials we typically pay for each additional molecule. And that quest for efficiency is now on aggregate, allowing us to dematerialize the world. I want to talk about one more problem. and. Uh, then let, I, I'd love to see what people want to talk about. The, the other problem that the Earth Day crowd brought up is that we were polluting the world. In addition to stripping it dry, we were polluting it and we were wiping species off the face of the planet. To which I can only say, yes, we absolutely were. This is the river in downtown Cleveland. This is the Cuyahoga caught on fire. <coughs> Uh, in 1968. This is actually not a picture from 1968. This is from the time the Cuyahoga caught on fire in 1954. Apparently, by the time it caught on fire in 1968, it was not even newsworthy enough to take a picture of. So rivers catching on fire in the downtowns of major American cities is not a great environmental indicator. We really were polluting the world. This is a graph of what atmospheric pollution levels looked like in America in the years leading up to Earth Day. This is an animal that is not with us anymore. This is the passenger pigeon. Uh, James Audubon came across a flock of passenger pigeons in 1815 that took three days to pass overhead. And he said at times that flock was so dense that it blotted out the sun. 
The last passenger pigeon died in a zoo in Cincinnati in 1914. We wiped them off the face of the planet, uh, mainly because we sent out massive hunting parties because these birds were an abundant cheap source of protein. And by the time we realized what we were doing, it was too late to stop doing it. The captive breeding programs didn't work. This pigeon is not with us anymore. Uh, here's the largest animal that has ever lived on the planet Earth. It's the blue whale. By one estimate, if we had this many blue whales in the world's southern oceans in 1900, we had this many by 1973. If your screen is cut off, there are two little symbol whales down at the lower right corner. By some estimates, we think there are about 500 individual animals living in the world's southern oceans of, of this species in the southern oceans in 1973. We came this close to wiping these animals off the face of the planet. And one of the things I'm intensely grateful to the modern environmental movement for and to the Earth Day movement for is taking to the streets and demanding that we stop. Because you will go a long way before you find a bigger fan of technology and markets than me. My Econ 101 textbook, uh, and probably the one that, that Alex, who I think is, hope, I hope is still on the call, has co-authored, says that markets by themselves don't deal with externalities very well. Pollution is externality number one. And if you allow all kinds of scarce non-renewable things like animals to be part of the market mechanism, they can get eaten up and they don't come back. And so the environmental movement was a, a popular movement demanding action on things like this. They got it from governments that listened to their people. So we put in place legislation in the wake of Earth Day that was in some cases really well designed and very effective and it has done a good job. The Cuyahoga is Andrew, now- May, about, may yeah. I ask you Andrew, to uh, wrap up slowly so we can yep, get- Yep, I've got three or four slides left. Uh, the Cuyahoga is now a trout fishing stream in, in and near Cleveland. This is what's been happening to pollution levels since 1970. The air is much, much, much cleaner than it was in earlier decades. Uh, Global warming is real and it's bad, but it's air condition, uh, but it's atmospheric pollution. If we wanted to deal with it, we know the playbook. This is the single greatest consensus I've ever seen in the economics profession, put a price on carbon with the carbon dividend. And then finally, if our blue whales were down here in 73, here's where they are by 2019. They are not all the way back, but they are coming back. So the third problem, you know, we're polluting the world and we're wiping out species. Yes, we absolutely are. Computers and capitalism are not going to solve that problem on their own. But if we have a public that demands action and a government that listens to its people and we do these things intelligently, I think we can solve our problems. So in the book, I call these the four horsemen of the optimist instead of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And my answer to the question that we started with, can we solve our big problems? Can we solve our big problems while continuing to grow and enjoy higher levels of prosperity? It, we absolutely can. I don't think this is a tough, uh, conceptually not a difficult thing to do at all. And the last picture that I wanna show, I love to end on a high note. This is not Photoshopped. This is a humpback whale breaching off the coast of New York City. They're back in some of these parts of the world. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much, Andrew. And um, we will, uh, we have a lot of claps here uh, in the audience. We will uh, save the questions for uh, afterwards, uh, just in case you you will be able to stay on a little longer. But I want to uh, get to our second speaker now, which is uh, Vernon Smith, and uh, who is Vernon Smith, and he will be speaking on um, uh, prices. And, uh, and when we introduce um, um, his work in the book, we go all the way back to um, the premises of civilization, and we kind of start with the premise that as a society, um, we we really have to coordinate a lot of different people with a lot of different goals. On the one hand, all of those people need to formulate plans to serve their goals. On the other hand, a tremendous amount of resources are employed in service of these plans. So what do we do? Um, and so without really some way of dividing those resources, we would get a combinatorially massive plant interference problem. Uh, but then faced with an interconnected physics of resources, we kind of had to learn how to gradually coordinate around them if we wanted to put them into use. The laws of physics gave us first the ability to start off creating a theory of transferable rights such as it is mine if it's on my property and yours if I transfer it to you and move it onto your property. But because we're ling linguistic, this uh, rights about physical goods could then be repackaged into more abstract things like give me the coins now, I promise to give you the coin, uh, the cow tomorrow. And this transferability of physical goods created a kind of a model in our minds of what it means for something to be property. 
once we had this notion, we could take less literally physical items and declare them to be property and again, create abstract arrangements such as contracts to manipulate them. And because again, continuing to be a participant in a particular contract is itself really valuable, uh, that right could then be treated as property for other contracts. And eventually we had this network of contracts um, and mesh with other contracts. And gradually markets evolved around this transferability of more complex institutions for manipulating rights um, and allowed parties to cooperate much more uh, creatively. And this is now coming to Werner's talk. Um, we particularly have the example of, um, for instance, if you look at pairwise barter deals, uh, where one good is exchanged only for another for immediate mutual benefit, they're really, really hard to find and only really yield part of a trade's full potential. But then large multi-way deals would yield the full potential, but are really difficult uh, to negotiate. And so the benefit of currency, as suggested by Miller and Drexler, in a paper we reference is that it allows the equivalent of such large multi-way barter deals to occur via separate pairwise trades. And then the benefit of prices, and here we come to Vernon's talk, uh, suggests that they represent a summary of individual valuations of a good, such as the demanders use value and the supplier's cost. And together, uh, Mark and Miller and, Drex and Eric Drexler suggest that if pairwise barter amounts to Pareto Hill climbing across a rough terrain with few available moves, Trade in the system with currency and prices amounts to hill climbing across a smoother terrain with many more available moves. So I'm really, really happy to discuss particularly the mechanism of prices and depth today with Vernon Smith. Thank you so, so much for joining. I'm hoping your wife is doing fantastic. And yeah, we are very, very, very delighted and honored to have you on this call. Thank you very much. Let me know if I should help you unmute. Ah, is that better? Yes, All perfect. right. Allison, thank you. Thank you so much for, for inviting me. And also, Andrew, thank you for that, uh, that great talk. You're a hard act to follow, okay? Uh, well, I want to talk about a project that I've been involved with, uh, with a co-author. Uh, not quite three years yet, we started, we've been working on this about two and a half years. And this all started when my co-author, Sabiu Inoua, wrote me from Niger in Africa. And he said, you might be interested in the attached manuscript. He said, you know what you did with your experimental markets, what they actually did was you rediscovered classical economics. Well, that got my attention because I never would have said anything quite like that. But uh, uh, the simple summary I can say is that he was dead right. And this launched me and us together into uh, a project in which we are examining the thread of intellectual development from Adam Smith through his French, English, and Italian followers uh, concerned with their perspective on, on how it is that people discover prices in markets. Okay? Now, you all, we're all aware of two ways of writing the demand function. Uh, Jevons and Walross and the general equilibrium followers of Jevons and Walross wrote quantity as a function of price. Marshall and the followers of Marshall inverted that they wrote price as a function of quantity. Well, uh, let me just say that they're both wrong. And the reason why they're wrong comes, comes directly out of chapter seven, book one of the Wealth of Nations. If you read, if you read Smith and also follow it, the elaborations of it that took place on the part of his 
his uh, followers, particularly the French, were in there quite early, within 20, 25 years of, of the publication of The Wealth of Nations. Uh, Adam Smith refers to people coming to market with reservation prices. Buyers have reservation demand prices, values, and sellers have re reservation values based upon their, upon their costs. Uh, and indeed, the reason why both of those perspectives on writing the demand function are wrong is that prices are discovered in markets. Prices don't exist until they're discovered in markets. So, so when Jevons and Walra uh, derive demand functions for individuals, they're having individuals maximize their utility sub subject to an income or budget or wealth uh, constraint for given prices. And the problem is there's no prices given. That's not a homework exercise that, that, that can be done because prices don't exist yet. They're, they are found by the buyers and sellers when they go to market. Now, if you read, uh, if you read chapter seven, uh, Adam Smith says that if buyers bring too little to market, it means that there are more buyers able and willing to, to pay a price equal to the supply price of sellers. And so there's a competition, entry competition takes place and buyers tend to bid up that price, okay? And if, and on the other hand, if sellers bring too much to market, then there's a competition that takes place uh, among sellers in lowering the price. Now notice here, uh, two things are, are revealed in that discussion. And the first is a, a dynamic, what we call a dynamic law of supply and demand, okay? And in a modern formulation that says, that if there's excess demand, price tends to rise. If there is excess supply, price tends to fall. Also, there is the phenomena of short side rationing taking place here. At a, at a price, uh, uh, if the price is too low, there's a competition takes place for the units offered among buyers. That's a one-sided kind of a competi competition that takes place. And you'll notice that there, that uh, at that price, uh, you have uh, the, the sales or, or the purchases by buyers cannot exceed the, the supply quantity. And similarly, when the price is too high, uh, buyers can't buy more, I'm, I'm sorry, sellers can't sell more than buyers buy. So there's a short side rationing principle here. And, and that's, that's important because that's not only part of the dynamics of the, the competition, but uh, it's precisely, you, you can have short side rationing and, and a stable market. And this is precisely what you have with, with a uh, perfectly uh, elastic or constant cost industry. And that, and, and that in the case of a constant cost industry, you have uh, sales by sellers deter determined by demand. And in fact, at that price, there will be an overhang. Uh, so, so this was our, uh, this is our description of the, of the dynamics and notice that this is 
quite capable of, math, of, of, of being stated mathematically because we're saying that price change and excess demand have the same, uh, have the same uh, sign. And so you can write that math mathematically. And, and the, the uh, so you can think of, 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 of a price in a market as uh, representing the median of these individual willingness to pay, uh, or I'm sorry, yeah, willingness to pay and willingness to accept uh, 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 discrete uh, values that are in the market. And, and also, it, it, an important part of comparing this classical perspective with the neoclassicals that you find in, in Jevons and Valra is that Jevons and Valra were talking about continuous commodity spaces. People were individuals were, were determining quantities that they would buy as a function of prices in continuous commodity spaces. The classical perspective, these, these were discrete, commodities were discrete. Uh, so, and indeed, go in, go in, what's in your shopping basket in, in the supermarket? What's in the, in the shopping basket of your neighbor? A pound of butter, a quart of milk, uh, a jar of olives, a box of Wheaties or cornflakes. People buy things, and, and we're talking about markets for consumer products, and those consumer products are non durables because we're talking about products that flow from sellers onto producers, onto markets. They're taken off that market and they disappear in consumption. Okay, that's the kind of a market we're talking about. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> now, the continuous representation of demand and of supply, of course, applies to things like securities. Uh, that are that are divisible, but that introduces a whole new uh, uh, phenomenon, a whole new class of issues. Because now you have, you see, in, in, in the ordinary consumer markets, there can be no difference between uh, what you might call the use value of a commodity and its exchange price because it cannot be purchased for resale. We're talking about good, final demand goods that are bought for consumption. As soon as you introduce the prospect of resale, then there's sort of two values in the market. If you, if you think about it from the perspective of that and spend. There's the value in use in consumption and there's the, there's the value in reselling it. And we know all we have to do is look at the housing markets and how quickly they became unglued in, from uh, 1929 to 1934, the, the value of a house became unglued from its resale, that is its use value became unglued from its uh, resale price. And similarly in the, in the run up of the, uh, to the great recession, uh, uh, the, the big run up in prices in, uh, in homes and then their, their collapse after that, where we see, where we see a, a, a substantial disconnect between the resale values of these assets and other, other measures of their value. Like for example, with, with homes, uh, the, uh, rental, their rental value. So, 
so this is the this is our project and uh, it's still underway. Uh, I can't praise my co-author enough. He is uh, he's essentially self-taught what can be a better way to get an education. And he's uh, he's uh, he, he's very good. He's had uh, he has undergraduate and master's level work in, in mathematics and statistics and has and he got interested in economics. And he was at Morocco University. And so he thought he would get a PhD. And so uh, he asked his professors about applying for a PhD. And they said, oh yeah, you're, you're well qualified. You, you, can, you can apply. But he says, but they told him, he says, you have one problem. You think too much like an engineer and not enough like an economist. And he said, so I went back home. And, uh, and then this is how we got connected. Okay, I'm going to stop now. Uh, this is uh, this is um, this is I'm my intention here is to give you an introduction to the kind of thinking that we're going through, and what's happened, and I can and, and I can assure you it has really been exciting. It, uh, it's in, it, for a person of my age to be involved in such exciting work in the last two or three years is phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, um, I shared the paper, or at least the paper draft, um, with people in the group in the chat if they want to uh, dig deeper, uh, especially into uh, into the formula. Um, so it's it's in the chat for those who who uh, who, who wish to do so. Uh, I would be personally really interested, and uh, also if anyone else would like to ask questions, please uh, please say so in the chat or just raise your hand, and I'll get to you. But um, you know, you, I think it's not the first time you know that you're. Um, uh, that you're reliving Adam Smith's principles. So what, like, because you at first you said you had rediscovered uh, this theory. What was that process, and how did you find out that you were rediscovering this, uh, the this theory by Adam Smith? And uh, yeah, what, uh, what do you think about it now? Uh, and moving forward, I would um, kind of like love to hear what you think that people in this group who are building technologies um, could take away from that in influencing the technologies that they are creating. Vernon? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> I got. Shall uh, I repeat? Yes, please do. My question was twofold. Once, what, uh, what did you real like? Or how, how, what, what, what was your uh, impression after realizing that you had rediscovered uh, this formula by Adam Smith? And then, second of all, and on a practical note, what do you think people in this group well, should take away from this uh, discovery when, uh, when thinking about the technologies that they're building in the future? Well. Uh, Look, my, my first experiment, uh, I had 22 undergraduates and it was the first day of class of a principal's class. And, we're, and this, is in, this is January, 1956, okay? And I, uh, made 11 of the of the members of the class buyers, 11 of them sellers. And I gave each buyer a value and each seller a value. And the buyers made money by selling a unit at a price below their value. And in fact, they, they, they got a profit equal to the difference between the value I had assigned them and, and the price that they got in that market. Sellers were the reverse. They, they each owned a unit and they got the difference between their value, uh, or I'm sorry, the price at which they sold the unit and, the, and this value. Uh, they were naive. These are just undergraduates. They the sophomores mostly. They had not yet read any any economics. 
Uh, I wanted to do it on the first day before they were contaminated by anything they might read in economics. Uh, they would never have seen an oral outcry double auction. Okay. Uh, and I described the rules for a two-sided outcry auction. And at that time, what was widely taught about markets? Well, for one thing, everybody in the market had to be a price taker. Each person, each member of the market had to be so small that, that he couldn't influence the price. These are the, these were the kinds of, of things that we believed and taught. And we're taught, and it didn't make any difference whether you went to Harvard or Yale or uh, or Cambridge University. This is the sort of thing that you that you got. So, uh, well, that was one story. There's also the Valrasian story, where there's an there is an there is an auctioneer who's not part of the economic process. But he comes in and tries out different prices and finds a market clearing price and then everyone buys and sells at that price. So th this is, was the state of our thinking when I did this experiment. So I had no expectation that this market would do anything other than flounder. But to my astonishment, it converged. It converts quickly to the prior pre-specified equilibrium in that market, you see. And my first thought was that it must, there's something wrong with the experiment. Okay, for one, and, and, and I thought I had found the, what was wrong with it, that the, uh, there was too much symmetry. Okay, the price, the average value, the average cost and price were all equal. So I did another experiment which was quite asymmetric. Okay, there was not symmetry of buyer and seller surpluses. It converged too. Well, gradually over the years, I disabused myself of this idea that I had, that my education had taught me anything useful about what we could understand in studying these markets. So that's sort of what got, uh, got me hooked on experimental economics. I never intended to do more than just a few experiments perhaps when I started, but that learning you see, and, and this opportunity for testing what it is you think you know, you see was overwhelming. But it wasn't until my encounter with Shabu you see, three years ago, that I became interested in how this connects up with classical economics. And, and believe me, <laughs> those early experiments, is, it's as though they came right out of Adam Smith's chapter seven. Thank you. Yeah, I think Mark has another question on uh, Adam Smith and how it relates to your work. Uh, yes. Um... So I've been very influenced by uh, what you write in your rediscovery of theory of moral sentiments and how Adam Smith has a model of human behavior that is not max U, as you call it, is not uh, char something characterized in terms of utility maximization or homo economicus, and that that better explains a lot of the anomalies, the game theory anomalies that you've experimentally demonstrated. I'm wondering what the bridge is from your exploration of how prices emerge from Adam Smith's theory of behavior uh, to your other, um, you know, to what you've been talking about today, which is also going back to Adam Smith on the formulation of prices. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, utility is not helpful, okay? If it, take the canonical case where People are in the market, buyers in the market to buy, each buy a single unit. Uh, okay. Well, okay, that unit has utility. Uh, but, it's, but 
but that utility is entirely and very operationally captured in the notion that buyers go to market with a maximum willingness to pay and sellers go to the market with a minimum, minimum willingness to accept. Buyers go there and are motivated to buy cheap, sellers to sell dear. And moreover, think about an auction. And, and by the way, Adam Smith was very much aware of auctions scattered through uh, various places in his writings, you'll find at least three or four references to auctions. And he clearly understands that an auction is where people come together. There's a single, in that case, a single unit up for sale. And that, and that there's a competition in which as people are name prices. As prices rise, people drop out of the market until there's only one left. So you're seeing, so Smith saw in that, you see a demonstration that people come to market with values and, and there are maximum willingnesses to pay, you see. So they let the price to go up. When the price is above their value, they drop out. So that understanding, you see, was right there in Adam Smith. Well, you don't, but he, he nowhere just writes down anywhere a discussion of auctions. It's one of these things that's just scattered through. And so much, uh, I think, of the, of the learning that comes from, from either of these two books is the thread of intellectual uh, comprehension that you get from Adam Smith, sometimes when he is, is just making an ancillary comments about something, but he's revealing a pattern of thinking, which it is, it takes many visits. I can't, I don't even, I can't, I don't, I can't count how many times I've read the, the, the theory of moral sentiments, especially the, about the first 100 to 150 pages uh, you see, and after a while, you get this capacity to think about things the way Adam Smith does, or at least you, that's what you believe you're able to do. You're beginning to see, you see how he puts these things together. And, uh, well, another comment about the connections between the two works, you see, if you read The Wealth of Nations stand alone without having read the theory of moral sentiments, which is the way I read it when I was a graduate student at the University of uh, Kansas, there are, there are quotations there that you can't really understand unless you read the theory of moral sentiments. For example, Smith says that every man so long as he does not violate the laws of justice, should be perfectly free to pursue his own interests in his own way. Okay, people read that and they say, hey, this is about selfish people in markets. <laughs> but you see, Notice that Adam Smith puts the qualifier, so long as they not, do not violate the laws of justice, up front before he finishes his sentence. Uh, that's, that's the thinking pattern of the person who wrote the theory of moral sentiments. Because it is, because he's not just talking about necessarily the written laws of justice, he's talking about the laws that we follow in, in our, uh, uh, in our daily interaction with our with our neighbors. Thank you. Yeah, I think that multiple people don't only first read Wealth of Nations and then Moral Sentiments, but they only read Wealth of Nations, <laughs> at least as it is right now. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Vernon and Andrew. I'm aware that we're at time. So in case you have to jump off, I want to give you uh, the option to opt out now and just thank you uh, for
uh, yeah, I'm an entire group for this discussion. In case you are able to stay on for a few uh, moments, we have another uh, question from Alan Karp and from Pranab Das. Um, you can give me a brief nod or I have to bow out. Yep, I've got a yeah? couple more okay. minutes. Okay, lovely. Well then, um, Alan and Pranab, do you want to unmute yourself one after the other? Because your question, I think, is a combined one. Um, yep, yeah, I'm Alan Karp. I have a PhD in astronomy, but I did a little bit of game theory as one of my, in a former life, one of my former lives. Um, I thought you said, Vernon, in your talk that um, the cost put a floor on the price. But I made a nice chunk of change because I knew that would be violated. Um, Cisco announced they were writing $2 billion in inventory. And I said, they're going to get something for that. And indeed, they got a billion dollars for it. Um, how does your model account for that? Well, uh, it's the point is the emphasis is on willingness to accept on, on the seller side. And, and that may be at a loss, okay? Because it's uh, better to make a small loss than an even bigger loss. Right. And so these kinds of things, so, so an important part of, of the willingness to accept of sellers you see, it has to do with this particular dimension. Now, you, I think you're talking about hard, go hard goods, you see, goods that are durable. Uh, and uh, other goods like services, you can't carry them over. They can't be stored, okay? You, uh, an airplane seat not filled is lost forever, okay? You can't store. Uh, most of the, uh, it's, a, it's about, uh, you see, uh, let's me, let me see, non-durable consumer items account for about uh, two thirds of, of uh, total final demand, all forms of demand, consumer demand. Uh, consumer and non-consumer then, all forms of demand. So it's, it's, it's a very large part of the economy, uh, non-durables. And, and by the way, they account for almost all the stability in the economy, not only in the economy, but in the laboratory. When we study these, these uh, non-durable goods markets, they're very stable. As soon as something can be retraded, there's all, for, all kinds of instability come in those markets. So about all the, almost all the instability in the economy comes from the 25% of the stuff that can, be, that can be retraded, okay? Now that's GDP. Of course, you go to securities markets, you're talking about a really large amount of stuff that can be traded, but those are not part of, of our final demand. <clears throat> Thank you. Prana, did this also answer your question because you're piggybacking off Alan? I, Alan. I think so. I, I also come from a physics background. I just want to thank both, both of the speakers, Andrew. I especially liked your uh, reference to internalizing external costs. So, so Vernon and Andrew, I guess I would just follow uh, Alan's question. We have good examples recently of negative, co uh, negative costs, negative prices uh, in a variety of situations where, where actors' values are discontinuous. So one thinks of China, for example, um, paying other countries to take its coal plants or situations in which various um, natural resource extraction entities would, would um, charge negative prices in order to maintain market value. I, do you have any problem with the idea that value may not be aligned across market actors? And so this establishment of the uh, inherent value associated with spans a pretty broad variety of dimensions of what value means to different actors. Well, look, the, the, the best person to, to determine uh, what value, what the value of a thing is to him in terms of reselling it or not is, is, the, is the person. I mean, the, the, in, this information is inherently decentralized in the economy. And, and the function of markets is to essentially 
aggregate that decentralized information into prices and those prices then become the signals broadly within the economy uh, that serve to coordinate one market, various markets with other markets. Um, and there, there is, no one has ever come up with a way of dealing with that in a centralized way that because the inform and, and essentially it, it's because it is inherently decentralized. And if you try to make decisions, macro decisions about markets, about commodities, uh, without that information, you're almost sure to get it wrong. So, you know, I think Hayek's discovery of this notion of markets as uh, the market system as being a price system, a, 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 an information system, uh, you see, and he, he got, well, how did he come to that? He came to it by, uh, in, the, in the, the great socialist debate. The socialist economists, the economists said, uh, it's very easy for socialism to emulate capitalism. They just use the Valrhesian auctioneer who tries out different prices and finds the equilibrium and goes, goes forward. And Hayek thought, well, surely it's got to be a little bit more, more complex than that. And it's, and it's that pattern of thinking stimulated by his, his uh, the, so, the great socialist debate, which was sort of his laboratory that led him to realize first in his 1937 paper and then in his 1945 AER paper, and there's two or three other great papers besides that that are, uh, that are less well known, unable to get his great insight, you see, about the pricing system as an information system. And I think that what, though what Sabu and I are doing is seeing much more clearly now how those elements were already in Adam Smith in chapter seven. Thanks. Andrew, do you want to go as well? Uh, no, not on this one. All right. Um, well, I think lots to say, uh, um, especially Hayek's reference to civilization as a superintelligent also shows up in chapter three in the book. But uh, perhaps I want to uh, give it to Kate with a final meta question that got a lot of attention in the chat. Hi. Um, it seems to me like a lot of uh, ideas in economics become simplified for the purposes of mathematical modeling. So uh, when you were talking about prices um, being misunderstood, it seems like that might have been a simplification made for the purposes of, of calculation. And I'm wondering how economics as a profession, um, as the institutions in economics, how it provides an incentive structure uh, for people to, to uh, focus on the formalizations and not on the human behavior in the experiments that you've been doing in economics. And so I'm curious how we can instead incentivize uh, research that correctly understands human behavior and focuses on experimenting with real human beings. Well, uh, are you asking is the question about how has to do with providing better incentives for people working on practical problems of public policy. Uh, is your question, or does your question have to do with uh, better incentives for for abstract work or, or scholarship that I, may not now exist. That is, I'm not quite sure what, how to interpret your question. Mm -hmm. I think it applies to both. I was mostly asking about the second. So in, in, in abstract um, economic research, which I'm a software engineer, so I'm not part of, I'm viewing it from the outside. Um, 
it seems like um, the introduction of some sort of uh, real life testing environment, like the blockchain environment or something like that, could assist in um, in in providing uh, real outcomes for some of these experiments. But I'm curious what your thoughts are. Well, I would only make one point, and that is, if you have some ideas along these lines test them before you put them in the practice. I mean, I think the most important lesson that I've learned in experimental economics is what a great uh, uh, environment it is for testing ideas out. And, 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 uh, and I'm talking about not only laboratory experiments, but also field experiments. You know, one of the most exciting periods of my life was in the 1990s when we uh, first started to introduce trading and electric power markets in the real world. And, and, and those introductions were first in New Zealand and second in Australia. And to actually see here the, the <clears throat> A, an incentive system that we had created in the laboratory saw it actually adopted in the field so that uh, in, and, and I mentioned Australia, there are other places, the UK, Chile, as well as New Zealand, also Singapore and Hong Kong, where uh, electric power markets became uh, much more organized around uh, pricing and, uh, and decentralized pricing in those markets and, and much less from the, fr from the point of view of, of monopoly ownership in the case of most power systems around the world prior to the 90s or the, the regulated system that is sort of unique in the United States for, for electric power systems. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Andrew, would you like to make a few comments or would you, either of you want to uh, care to make a closing remark? No, just thank you for having me. This has been a, a treat. All right, lovely. Well, I can't thank you enough uh, for both of your perspectives. I think um, you know they really gave uh, a very detailed analysis of what we could only uh, hope to have referenced uh, in terms of your work in the book. So thank you so 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 much for joining. I'm really tremendously um, yeah I'm tremendously grateful that you take the time to, uh, to to join for this group. I think that everyone here had a really fantastic time. Lots of I think bits are slowly threading together, and lots of uh, I think connections have been weaved together even in the chat. Uh, between different works that we reference in the book and that um, multiple other people have contributed. So thank you very, very much for joining. Uh, I'm very, yeah, very, uh, very honored to have had you both on uh, and a big applause from, uh, from people in this group. Um, if people want to have context for the ideas discussed here, I just shared the chapter draft again in the book in which we reference both of their work. And for those who still want to continue to stay on, uh, we are now going to meet on Gather, which we do at every of our Thursday meetings once a week. Um, and this is totally optional, but uh, we're joining in this uh, gather group. This is a more decentralized way where, where you can sit on different tables and so on and so forth. I am super excited to see you again on Monday uh, for Tyler Cohen and um, very, very uh, happy weekend. I'm hoping that perhaps you get a chance to look into the book over the weekend. We would love, uh, we would love your feedback. Thank you so, so much for joining everyone. And yeah, I'm super excited to see you on gather in just a second. And that link is posted in the chat. So for those of you who want to stay on for an after show social, I'll see you there. Bye, everyone. Thank you.